The video you're about to watch has been designed to take you deeper, higher, and wider into Yahweh. Enjoy, and please subscribe. Thank you. Father, it's in the remembrance of you. It's in the remembrance of what Yeshua did on the cross that we get to eat of him. And I want you, where you're sitting right now in this time of prayer, I want you to take communion without the actual elements. So I want you to step into the spirit where you should have been for a while in worshiping. And I want you to start eating and drinking, coming one with him. Let the substance of his glory reform you. The substance of his fullness. Let the yard and the hay and the valve and the hay overshadow you. The yard and the hay and the shen and the valve the hay. Let each one of these living letters overshadow you. It's their fiery gates that shoots the revelation and dimensions of Yahweh at you, that opens you up to another entire new kingdom that's inside of Yahweh. You get to go in, and as you go in, you get to eat of him and drink of him. But it's not so much what we understand in the natural is of eating bread and drinking wine, it's of becoming one with him, shifting into him. Having his essence overshadow you. Having his breath blown over you and in you and through you. And all of who Yahweh is in his full capacity. The omni power. Omnipotence. And all the glory, the fire, revelation, knowledge. It all just wants to overshadow you. His desire is to remind you that you are created in his image and in his likeness. And that includes body, soul, spirit. We've gone on a journey over the last couple of weeks. To understand his desire for us to be glorified spirit, glorified soul, glorified body, and then to be reminded that the new creation is a complete and utter glorified being, consumed in the fullness of the glory of Yahweh, walking the earth. Father, I ask that you open our hearts tonight to receive revelation and to run with it and to understand it, to have insight and revelation and the mysteries and secrets that you're revealing to us. Slowly but surely, your sons and daughters have been beginning to understand it. We're running with it. It's deep inside of us. As spirit beings, we're beginning to understand that it's infused knowledge that's always been there. And slowly but surely, it's getting downloaded to the soul and the body, and it's beginning to change our DNA. Father, we love you. We praise you. Stay with you. Amen. How you guys doing? Yeah. Okay. So we have uh, at this point we've done the spirit, soul, and tonight we're doing body. We'll see if. Uh, the idea behind this is an encounter the Father showed me, and I've shared it several times, and I'm just going to quickly share it again so you have the background on it again. Um, I was caught up into the spirit realm. I remember standing on the Golden Mountain, and in this position, I was looking at a lake of gold. That's what it looked like, liquid gold. And of course, my immediate understanding of liquid gold is like it would be like lava. You can't get near it. You can't go into it. So my spirit, just knowing that it needs to go in there, I dove in and it wasn't hot at all. It was actually refreshing. It actually felt like it was adding life to me. And at the bottom of this uh, lake, there was uh, diamonds, rubies, gold. There was wisdom, revelation, knowledge, and scroll form, books. There was uh, fire, lightning. There was power, like electricity. And I remember that it having these three rivers that it would um, set into the kingdom of heaven. And it, each one of these rivers had divided or was in the lake up into specific portions. Uh, the one was um, had the richest diamonds, currency, gold, all these precious stones were flowing in the first river. Second river had all the wisdom, revelation, knowledge, in scroll form, books, understanding, all just flowing into this river. And then um, the third river had all the power, electricity, fire. Um, 
running through that river. And I remember the Father then beginning to teach me or show me how my soul, my spirit is in the first river, my soul is in the second river, my body is in the third river, and how my spirit needs the, the riches of the heavens to gain uh, or have real assembly to who it was before it was sent into the womb, attached to my soul. And then of course the, the um, wisdom and revelation is for my soul to engage that which comes out of the kingdom of heaven which is attached to my spirit. And then of course my body will have the power of the fire, the um, lightning bolts and it was, it was just power basically. And then um, only at a later stage as I engage with this more, I begin to realize that there's a fourth river. And this fourth river was uh, flowing into the kingdom of heaven, but it had an end destination, which was a tree. Uh, and I presume that it was the tree of life. Um, but the Father began to teach me a little bit about the body, soul, and spirit. Of course, I, I, I took uh, a lot of my understanding that I've gained over the years of body, soul, spirit. Of course, I, I did many Bible schools and the, the, the church age did teach you about body, soul, and spirit. Um, I remember being part of a Bible school where myself and my wife was the teachers, and so we had to teach it as well. Um, eventually, when I started entering beyond the veil, the revelation kind of expanded and changed slowly. So I was driving back from that, um, Tennessee, and uh, in the car, the Father was begin beginning to download these revelations to me. So, I really believe that the body of Christ needs to believe that there's an understanding and a revelation beyond what we've been taught. Because I was taught you will, you will get born again and your spirit's glorified. Which means if you die, you go to hell. You go to, hell. You go to heaven. Right? And then your soul goes through a, life, a lifetime process. And when you die, your body will be glorified. No, that's what we've been taught. I don't know what you've been taught, that's what theology taught me. Right. Then I began to understand uh, going beyond the veil and of course just studying Yeshua because he's my example and he was glorified before he went into the heavens. Right? And so the Father began to show me that he wants us to understand that we can be glorified. And just to really have the revelation of what it is to be glorified. Right. So that's quite exciting, right? And uh, am I there yet? No. Am I, am I going there? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Have I seen an extreme change in my life? Yes, I have. Um, is, it, is it something that we can just step into? I really don't believe that. I don't believe it's something we can just step into. It's a lifetime of a belief system that needs to be changed. It's something you can hear a million times and still it won't activate a belief system in your, in, your, in your being. Which means you will hear it and hear it and hear it and hear it and it will sound great. But are you really going to activate it by stepping into it? You know, is that something we can perceive? In the natural, I cannot understand eternal life. I do not understand a life without sickness and disease. I don't perceive a life where I have the capacity to stand over the sun and moon and I no longer uh, uh, hit by the day and the night. Does that make any sense? Which means my, my morning and my night means I'm a day older. Right. And we don't understand that the Father wants us to overshadow that. We begin to understand who we are as the body of Christ, living on this side of the veil, but that side of the veil, being aliens to the earth. Aliens with dominion and authority, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we begin to understand that my body is my earth suit. I cannot live on this planet without it. Right? right? That's kind of logic. Right. Now, I need to just go back a little bit and remind you that Adam in his first estate. You guys know what that means? Right. Well, Adam in the kingdom of heaven before he was skinned and sent into the earth never came into the earth. According to my Bible, he was taken out of paradise and put in Eden. Right? Now we have to understand that his body was on the inside. Right. And his body wasn't formed of flesh and blood, like what we perceive. Right. It was a glorified body and it was formed out of conjugal light. Right. Now we understand that that which was formed out of the dust of the earth was not dust like we perceive it, but it was pure gold uh, directly from the throne of Yahweh, right, right out of the river Pison. Right. And we understand the river Pison flowed red, which means there was pure gold in it. Because if you take pure gold powder and you put it into water, it runs red. And we begin to understand that we are formed um, 
and our first estate to look completely different than what we are today. It's because of sin that we were skinned, and because we were skinned, we no longer had access into the kingdom of heaven, right? right. So now we are in the process of getting the skinned body back into its glorified state. Right. And we have the capacity to do that through Yeshua. Because we look at his life, and we are reminded he didn't die for me, he died as me. I live in him, therefore his death was my death. His resurrection is my resurrection. The life that he lives, I live in him. Right. So as he walks in the earth glorified for 40 days, that's the capacity he's called me to walk in. Now, is it just for 40 days? No, it's not. But we have to begin to believe that it's a possibility. Now, you have to understand, it's basically me coming to you and say, listen, guys, grass is not green. Right. That's how difficult this is to really understand grass. Because it's a belief system that you have to change. Sure. It's something that you have to re-establish in who you are. Yes. Can I be glorified? Yes. What does it mean to be glorified? Look at the 40 days of Yeshua. <clears throat> in Ephesians 1 it says this, In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, to the praise of His glory, reminding you that in Him is my inheritance, which means inheritance is that which was His when He was in the earth. You got to understand that. It has to be because that is what He left behind. There's another dimension to that because it's not just what He left behind. But if we just had a focus on what He left behind, it is the signs and the wonders and the miracles. It is the love and the passion and the fullness of the power of Yahweh. It is the revelation inside the knowledge. It is the yoke that He carried. It is the glorified state that He walked in before He was ascended. But it's a whole different place because we just look at Him as, well, the promises that was given. Well, the promises wasn't really given for Him. It was given in the Old Testament, which is really ours, but it's not our inheritance. But it could be because he's taken it upon himself, and yes, it's part of who we are. But there's more to it than just that. It's in him that we get to expand who we are, and we get to begin to understand what he desires for us to operate in and aside. That's why he says, eat of me. Yeah. Why? Because he's incorruptible. Yeah. He's immortal. Yeah. He, he has eternal life, even in his living state, where he has face-to-face -face communication with sons and daughters in the earth. And what I love about Yeshua is he stands before his father and he says, now glorify me. Right. Now you have to understand, he didn't say, now glorify me as God. He said, now glorify me as son. Right. And that's why he's our example. Right. He was God fully, but he gave up his deity right. until his resurrection. Right. Once he was resurrected, his deity was restored and he was no longer son of God. Right. He was God, Yahweh, in his full state. Right. In the earth, my right. example. The yard, the hay, the shin, the vav, the hay. For our citizenship is in heaven. I'm sorry to say that, Americans. <laughs> <laughs> From which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to even to subdue all things to himself. So it's a glorified body that we have in him. Now we can, we can like a parrot study the word and understand, well I'm in him so everything that's, that's, that's in him is mine and I am glorified. But how many of you understand, although I am righteous, I only really begin to walk a righteous, in righteous understanding when I live a righteous life. Because otherwise, I just believe I'm righteous, but I don't live a righteous life, so I'll never really con conform to righteousness. Right. Now, righteousness is a gift that can't be more righteous or less righteous. But it's in the revelation of righteousness that I excel in righteousness. Yes. And it's the same with glorification. It's understanding that in Him I'm glorified, but it's not just the word spoken. Because the word spoken is not going to propel me into actually being glorified. Right. Same as knowing that the word of God says I'm seated in Him in heavenly places, but that's just something I've studied like a parrot. Right. I haven't actually physically, as a spirit being, seen myself seated in Christ in heavenly places, understanding that I have authority in more than one place. Now, the minion in more than one place, that I walk in him and have authority all over the dimensions and realms that he created for me to walk in. Yeah. But it's not because I understand it in word. 
It's not something that I've studied and meditated on. It's something I shift me into, and it's a reality according to me being a spirit man and not a, and not a soulish man. Right. It's that shift. And we begin to understand that the Father wants us to know what the glorified body would be like. We understand that it would be like Jesus' resurrected body. Okay, now what does that come from? What does that mean? <laughs> Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew Him not. Now this is where the whole science and wonder thing has to kind of shift out. Because I believe in all my heart that, that, that the church has missed this completely. <laughs> Yeshua looked at the Pharisees and said, You just want signs and wonders. You're not going to get a sign. You're not going to get a one. Right. right? But the church at this point has made the gifts the all in all. Right. It's all about the gifts because that's the signs and the wonder. But all of this signs and wonders happens in the church. Yeah. Now, none of the signs and wonders that Yeshua did happen in the church. It happened in the streets. Right. Okay, where the unbelievers saw and believed. <laughs> now we're doing signs and wonders in the church so the believers can believe. <laughs> Have you ever heard uh, David... David uh, Hogan preach. Yeah. He loves looking at the unbelievers, of the believers saying, you bunch of unbelievers. Right. Right. Because we come to church to see the signs and wonders so we can believe. What type of weirdness is that? Yeah. Yahweh is desiring a people that will be signs and wonders. Right. Now, let me tell you something, the glorified man walks being a sign and a wonder. That's when we begin to overshadow the sun and the moon. That's when we begin to control the weather. That's when we begin to take back authority. We begin to understand who we are as sons with dominion and sovereignty over the earth. We begin to understand who we are in Him because we live and move and our being, not in this realm, not on this side of the veil, but behind the veil in Him. Yeah. Seated, seated with Him in heaven place. You must understand, when Yahweh talks about seated, He's not just talking about someone sitting on a chair chilling. He's talking about you on your throne as a king ruling from out of him. Yeah. It's a whole different dimension, a whole different place. Mm -hmm. Beloved, now are we the sons of God? And if if doth not yet appear, what shall we be? But we shall but we know that when we shall appear we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now <laughs> Yeshua at his death, Yahweh tore the veil. How many understand that? And why did he tore the veil? So that we can go and see him. Yeah. Now you have to understand something. The veil didn't have to tear. Right. Oh, uh, 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 how can I say that? Well, I look at Enoch. Right. The veil wasn't torn yet. Right. right? I look at Moses. The veil wasn't torn yet. I look at Joshua. The veil wasn't torn yet. I look at David. They're experiencing a realm that wasn't even available yet, but you can step into it. And we begin to understand the veil is intimacy. Right. And the removing of the veil is so that we can understand we don't need to, we don't need a mediator. Now, please don't, I'm not excluding Christ, but I'm saying we do not need to have someone come in to, for, for me to become or have a relationship with Yahweh. Right. But I look at I look at Enoch and he had intimacy with Yeshua or with Yahweh before there was even a possibility. He went in beyond the veil before there was a veil. Right. He entered into a kingdom that he was not allowed to go into according to what the word says. Right. Because in the way there was an angel, two angels, and a sword, a flaming sword. Right. So in essence, as a man covered in skins, he should not have been able to go on and go in. But because of his relationship. It was the intimacy that he had with the Father that brought him to a glorification. Because it's the glorified state that put our body, soul, and spirit into the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And we look at David in the same manner. It was his love for worship, his love for intimacy, his love for Yahweh that opened up the veil for him. Right? It was the love of Yeshua for the people that opened up the veil. Now, of course, we understand that because the veil is now uplifted, uh, because there is no veil, we get to enter in. We get to spend intimate time in Him so we can physically understand what needs to shift and change in me for me to become a glorified being, for me to become a glorified body. Does that make any sense? Yes. So Yeshua appears after His death and Mary, now you have to understand, Mary wasn't just some Tom, Dick and Harry that knew Him. And says, I know that guy, I've seen him a couple of times, he's a good guy. 
uh, this was Mary, not, not his mother, this was a prostitute that he, that, that loved him, that spent time with him, that found him extremely valuable. She had her head resting on his chest several times. She worshipped and adored him. She knew him. And at his resurrection, she didn't understand. She didn't know who he was. She thought he was the gardener. So the glorified state looks different at first. But after a while, she realized that it is God. It is Yeshua. We understand that he could appear and disappear. He, he looked different. He could change his appearance so that they didn't recognize him. We also understand that his body was bone and flesh. In Luke it says, Behold my hands and my feet, this is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, and yet you see me have. And when he have, uh, had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. Just to remind you that you know, there's, a, there's a young man, and I would, I would urge you to go listen to his testimony. His name is Mark Steen. Have you ever listened to his testimony? It's kind of crazy and it's kind of incredible. But one of the things that we have to begin to understand is this young man doesn't have a brain. <laughs> how, do you even, how do you even say that without thinking, I know, well, that just sounds retarded. That doesn't sound right. You shouldn't be able to function. You shouldn't be able to lie. Matter of fact, um, in his testimony, they say that they've done, they've done brain scans and all they find there is a blue flame burning. So according to the, the medical science, he should not be able to function in any way, fashion, or form. Never mind have kids. Never mind even live. Yet he's got like nine kids or ten kids. He functions like a normal being, but he takes his body into heaven every two, three days. Which means he disappears off the face of the planet. You know, I said this many times, but Ian shared a testimony where he's sitting next to um, Mark Steen in worship. And he ascends and he dies. His body is physically dead. Because his body can't function without his spirit in it. Now, I, just, I just believe the Father wants us to begin to understand the possibility of change. Now, how radical is it going to be when we begin to understand what it means to be glorified? When, when we begin to walk as glorified beings, they talk about a man in the earth that's three, four hundred years old. The fathers of this movement that has been on the earth for many, many years, that's not dying, but has been glorified, that dis disappear after the physical realm, into the spirit realm, and live there, and appear whenever they want to. Now I know, that, well, where's the evidence, where's the proof of that? Well, we look at our Isaiah, he's, he's experienced that. Right. Enoch experienced that same thing. Right. And we're not 100% sure, but we're now beginning to believe that John never died. Right. And of course, these men are appearing in the face of the earth as we speak. Not just appearing, but I've heard testimonies where uh, Enoch um, uh, arranged a meeting for Justin Abraham. But he thought he was going to just go and be a guest at a conference. In the meantime, he was the guest speaker. He didn't even know that he was the guest speaker. No one said anything or done anything. He just got there and they said, okay, you're up. And he's like, what? And he realized he'd been walking with, with Enoch and that's exactly what Enoch wanted to do. I know that sounds crazy, but the Father wants us to begin to understand that there's so much that we can go into when we go into that which was spoken and that which is living. When we go into more than just that which is written, because that which is written is what we can see, perceive, and understand. That which is spoken, we have to go into a spirit. That which is living, we have to go, have to go into a spirit. That changes everything, because uh, the ecclesia haven't been able to do that. It's only now that we're beginning to believe it's possible to go into the kingdom of heaven without having to die first, that we get to live and move and have our being in a kingdom that we can't even perceive or understand the natural, but yet my spirit man knows all these things and understands it all. It's the download that now needs to take place. So we understand that the body will be physical, which means on this side of the veil, I can be glorified. Meaning that as long as I'm eating of him and drinking of him, and I, I, I don't know how this will work, but I've found myself to constantly eat of him and drink of him. Matter of fact, every meal I have, that's my focus. Now, I'm busy eating of him, drinking of him. It's, it's the goal in my heart is to have my DNA aligned and changed. Yeah. Because at this moment, my DNA is linked to a corruptible bloodline. It's supposed to be incorruptible. It is mortal. It should be immortal. Right, right. 
And we can't understand that because for, for, for me it's been 43 years, for some of you yeah, it's been more, for some it's been less. Then of course it's generational, so it's not just something I believed for the last 43 years, it's what I was taught. You will die. Matter of fact, in every study I've done theology-wise, I was taught you will die. But how many of you understand, the curse about age was the Old Testament, and that no longer applies. Now I'm not saying the Old Testament no longer applies, don't misquote me. I'm saying that that curse lifted through Christ Jesus. So we have to kind of change our mindset, the way we think and perceive. Because you can continue to believe while well, you're never going to grow older than 120 and you'll die before the time. And an average between 70 and 90, that's, that's, that's pushing it. And it's okay. Come to understand, it's okay to die. Matter of fact, Peter, uh, Paul says, well, for me to live it's, it's great, for me to die is even great. It doesn't matter. But can we believe that this body does not have to die? You know, I've walked in the spirit for the last seven years and it's blown me away. And only since I started walking in the spirit can I imagine or fathom the fact that I have authority over the sun and moon. Now again, it's a, it's a mindset that I can't perceive in the natural. So when I'm in the spirit, I can overshadow it. But when I'm in the natural, I can't understand it. I can't even begin to fathom how can my, my, my morning and my night be anything other than the next day. Because that's all I've known. It's a belief system that has to change. Where I understand, well, my night and my morning doesn't have to be the next day. Because I'm eating and drinking of Him. He's eternal. That's what His Bible tells me. If I eat of Him and drink of Him, I will have everlasting life. Wow. And that does not mean eternal life. It means a life that does not end. Wow. And we're beginning to understand according to science that my body was designed to live forever. Have you ever done that study? It shows us that your organs are designed to recreate itself every seven years. Your heart doesn't have to recreate itself because it's designed to live forever. It doesn't overwork itself, it doesn't underwork itself. It's designed to just continue with what it's designed to do. So we were created to live forever. Yes. And of course the Bible makes it very clear that your heart's more than just that which keeps you alive. It's actually the substance that you're meant to use to think with. And when you start thinking with your heart, you understand your heart is related to your spirit, meaning that I have to think and meditate on the things above. When I begin to meditate on things through my heart, it's only but through the kingdom of heaven. So there's only life, only fullness of life, there's no death, it's just uh, Zoe life, the God type of life. That changes my perception and it changes the DNA and the way that I perceive things in the natural. But it's a meditation that needs to be constant. In John, it talks about Jesus said, Jesus saying to them, Come and eat breakfast. Um, yet none of his disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Then Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So even in his glorified state, he was eating food. Exciting, isn't it? <laughs> But while they still did not believe for joy, they did not believe for joy and marvel, he said to them, "Have you have any food here?" This is uh, again, this is in John, of Luke, the same, same, same scripture, just in Luke. Um, so they gave him a piece of bro broiled fish and um, some honeycomb. That's a nasty combination. Fish and honeycomb. Yeah. <laughs> Yummy. <laughs> I'm gonna pass. Thank you, Yeshua. And he took it and ate it in their presence. We need to begin to understand that the Father wants us to see the natural within the supernatural. Yeah. And that's not really something we can do because we kind of be subconsciously taught how to separate everything. Right? Sunday's church day. Maybe Wednesday depends on where you go to. <laughs> <laughs> right? The rest of the week's work, family. Don't, don't mix them in. If you're in politics, don't mix your faith in your politics and, and don't bring that into your family. Sorry, I've got an alarm going off here. But we're beginning to understand the Father's desire for us to open up everything and live out of the same dimension. Everything is Christian, everything is spiritual, everything is His will, everything is out of Him. We live and do life only but from out of His kingdom. And that opens up us uh, up to begin to understand that body, soul, flesh, it's all one thing. It's a dimension that needs to change. Now, I remind you, I am not called to go back to where Adam was. Right. Because I now have the capacity 
through sin. Exciting, isn't it? And of course, the restoration of who I am to no longer want to be like Adam, but now to be like the glorified Yeshua, which is a whole different creature. And that sounds terrible. A whole different creation. It's the new. Now, the new means that there's never been anything like this on the face of the planet. And we understand that he was the firstborn. Right. Now, the firstborn is the one that takes all the judgment. Right. Everything goes to the firstborn. And the firstborn uh, is the law of the firstborn. It's not a nice law. Everybody says, well, it sounds nice to be the firstborn because you get the inheritance. Hmm. Now, but remind yourself that the firstborn is more than just that. All the responsibility of the secondborn goes on the firstborn. Right. <laughs> Meaning that if the secondborn uh, commits adultery um, and runs away, the firstborn is responsible for it. If the secondborn dies, the firstborn has to look after the secondborn's family, marry his, his wife. There's a lot of responsibility. We also understand that Jesus was the seed, which means we are the fruit. Now, how many of you understand? This might, this might make quite sense to you yet, but, but the fruit and the seed is not the same thing. The fruit has so much more than the seed. That's why he would go as far as to say, I want you to do greater things than what I did. Because I'm just the seed, but you're the fruit. But they have to understand, the seed becomes the tree. And the tree bears multiple fruits, and you're a fruit. Within the fruit is the capacity of multiple trees, which will be then multiple fruits. So he's literally telling you that you're a whole different creation, even to what he is. That's where the whole understanding of baptism comes in. Because in baptism there's two substances that has to become a whole new substance. Right. And that's what the Father wants us to understand in being glorified. I have to become a whole new substance. Right. I have to understand that it's the fruit. I am no longer just the seed. I am more than the seed. Now that doesn't tell me, how can you say you're more than Christ? Well, He was my example. And He said you should do greater things than this. So we need to begin to believe that He's called us to a greater height than what he is. And, and that's, that's the heart of the father. Right. Any father in this room will understand what I'm saying. Right. Your passion, your desire, even mothers, your passion, your desire is so that your kids go to a higher place than you. Right. You want them to do better. You want them to be more financially secure. You want them to have a greater revelation of insight and the things that you already know. Right. You want them to pr proceed in a, in a greater height. That's just the father's desire. And he's called us to excel. Our bodies will be immor immoral, Im immoral, it's already immoral, <laughs> immortal and incorruptible. It will not die, decay, have pain or sickness. Now I know that this statement overshadows everybody. Now I mean I've been in the gym for 28 years and um, I know that my body is in pain and I do not hurt. <laughs> it's not accidental, you know. I, if I do something wrong, if I do the wrong movement, I will have back problems for a week. My back will be sore for a week, or, or two or three days. If I do something wrong, I have my knees sore, or I push too heavy, my ankles are sore, or my hips are sore. I do something wrong, and there's a tweak somewhere in my body, and it's painful. So I've been living with pain on purpose for several years. And of course, if the next morning comes and my body is not stiff, and I didn't train hard, so then I'm going to punish my body the next day even harder because something went wrong. That was confounding. Wow. That's just the gym industry. Don't look at me with that tone. And for most of us, it's while I've fallen off a, a cliff, I hurt my back. I, I, I remember I was a little boy, maybe 14 years old. I climbed down to a water pump. Uh, it was about, um, it was about 10, 10 meters, which is really high. But probably not 10 meters, maybe 6 meters. I don't know how that's, uh, shoot, six times three, uh, maybe 18, maybe 20 feet high. And I grab, my friend standing on this side, I'm standing on this side, there's a pole in between us. I grab the pole to swing around him, and the pole's loose. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I go, yeah. <laughs> I land on my feet, and of course now, you know, it's pride because all these ladies were there, and my friends were there. And I just get off as if nothing happened, and I run around, around to the back, start climbing up, and then all of a sudden, the adrenaline stopped pumping through the veins. And I broke my foot, and I'm stuck there halfway up the water pump, and I can't go, I can't move. So we are conditioned to believe that our bodies are going to be in pain, 
Um, you get a call there which says at the time of the year we have conditioned our being to believe, well, this time of the year I'm going to get a cold, or this time of the year I'm going to start getting hay fever, or I can feel a headache coming, it's coming, or I have oh, all my knees giving me problems again, it's just going to get worse. It's just going to get worse and worse. I have to go to the doctor. That's what we condition to believe. So we constantly talk about this. And we've experienced right through our lives. So me saying, well, our bodies will be uh, immortal and incorruptible. It will not die. It will not decay. It will have no pain or sickness. It's like, well, I can't even fathom that. But how do you understand? There's something in us that needs to change. That's right. Your belief system has to end. And it's all about intimacy. It's all about going deeper and deeper into knowing him, stepping behind the veil, then operating from out of his heartbeat. Because it's in that realm where I meditate on what I see, where I draw from what I experience. And then of course we've been doing the same thing in our Christian faith, but we've been on this side of the veil, drawing from what we see around us. And what do we see? Death and decay. Destruction. That's why the church looks like it does. But now that we get to go as spirit beings into the kingdom of heaven, I draw from what I see there. That changes who I am. That changes my DNA. That's why I'm constantly eating of him, drinking of him, eating all of who he is, his breath, his glory, his fire, engaging with the seven spirits, having that fire burn over me and overshadow me as a spirit so my spirit can come into the earth and overshadow my soul and my body. And then, of course, it overshadows the rest of the earth and creation around me, brings alignment. In 1 Corinthians it says, also, um, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The, the body is sown in, corrupt, in corruption and raised in incorruption. In Revelation it says, and God will wipe away every tear from their, from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sh sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no pain, for the former things have passed away. Now in the Greek mindset you think, oh that's when we're in heaven. Lord, Lord, Lord. But it never says that. But when we begin to understand his desire is for you to live in him now. And to understand what it means to live in him is that my spirit is in him physically because I'm a spirit being. I'm no longer a human being. Now, I know that people don't like me to say that. They don't want to think that I'm not a human being because how can you say I'm not being a human being? I'm going to be a human being forever. But you have to understand where this comes from. Because I'm in his image and in his likeness. And before I was anything other than what I am today, I was in his likeness. And I was spirit. So I'm primarily a spirit being that has a soul and a body. And my spirit has to overshadow my soul and my body. So my soul and my body can function in the fullness that it was designed to function in. Anything outside of my spirit overshadowing my soul and my body is out of alignment. How are you guys doing? It will be a glorious body. It will be beautiful. Hmm. That's exciting, right? Yes. How many of you understand that that will never change for you unless you can see yourself in that manner now? Yes. You know, one of the major problems we have as human beings is you will always find fault in yourself. Right. And that, that is the way we perceive what we look at. Therefore, the curse stays upon you. If you're not happy with what you see now, you will never be happy with what you see. And I remember being a personal trainer. That was my focus with my clients. Unless you can be happy with what you see now, you will never be happy with what you see even when you have reached your goals. You have to begin to see yourself according to what he sees you be. And he does not see you as a fleshly being. Yes, it's, it's part of who you are. I'm not, I'm not saying that my flesh is less important than we have to understand that because it's not. We've made our flesh, our body, a lesser being. Oh, well, this thing's going to die anyway. Let me eat as much crap <laughs> as I can. I say it like that, but it doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> it's like saying, I want to tell my kids to shut up, but it doesn't sound right, so you say, shut it up, be. Yeah. Sound a little bit better, it's the same word. Sure. <laughs> okay, whatever. In Philippians it says, Who will transform our holy bodies that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able to even uh, subdue all things to himself. It is his desire for us to see how he will raise us up and have us reflect who we are and who we were created to be, but having the understanding of what we see through his eyes. Because when I look at myself from my own eyes, I just see what I have been conditioned to believe it should be. Now you have to understand, and I know, I know it's not quite the same for men, but it actually is. 
Um, women have been designed to believe according to what they see in magazines, and so men kind of as well. Uh, if it's not if it's not a six pack with nice pecs and shoulders and good quads, then there's something wrong, you know. Same with men. If it's not skinny legs and skinny tummy, big boobies and small shoulders, then it's just not right. You know, because that's what we see when we look at the magazine, so that's how it should be. So if I look in the mirror and I don't see that, then I say something wrong with me. I can't love what I see until it looks like what it's conditioned to believe it should be like. And of course the Father wants us to engage in Him so that what I see, I see through His eyes. Because He doesn't look at me and see my love handles. He doesn't look at me and see the weirdness of my hair, which is not growing here anymore, but it's now coming out here, on my shoulders, <laughs> down my back, every way up. So I don't understand how that works. Uh, I, I never had, I haven't had hair in a long time, so I don't wake up in the morning with messy hair. That's nice. But now I wake up with a messy beard. <laughs> like, okay, fine, I'm going to have to trim my beard. Because that doesn't work for me. Waking up and it's like... <laughs> <laughs> but I need to understand the Father wants us to begin to see who we are meant to be, body, soul, spirit, through His eyes. And it's different. It's not the same as what we see. You know, I have learned over the last several years to look at um, God's people through His eyes. Now, I know this sounds maybe a little bit weird, I'm not sure, but I have never seen, I, and since I got this mantle of love, I no longer see an ugly woman. There's no such thing as an ugly woman. There's no such thing as an ugly man. And it's just not something that I can perceive in the natural, because the Father has shown me His creation through His eyes. It changes everything. Everyone is beautiful, everyone is phenomenal, everyone is amazing. And I like to say that, you know what, my wife, she does stuff that, that I can't do. I can't look at a woman and say, oh, you look beautiful. I can't look at a girl, a woman, and say, you look great. And I, I don't do that because it's just not, uh, as a married man, I don't think it's a good idea. Sometimes, if it's a good friend, I'll tell her she looks great or you look good, but it's not really my place anymore. But today, I remember coming out uh, of, uh, we're going towards the childcare, and a lady comes out of the childcare, and I'm thinking to myself, geez, this lady's lost a lot of weight, she looks good. But I'm not going to look at her and tell her that, but my wife says, wow, you look great, you've lost so much weight. And now I'm telling you, that little girl, she's not a little girl, she's that lady just lifts up and everything changes. And I believe the Father wants us to begin to see what He sees when He looks at us. He says His creation is beautiful. And of course, in the glorified state, everything changes. Exciting, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> it will be a powerful supernatural body. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors shut, uh, where the disciples were assembled for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. It is his desire for us to see this. Um, when Yahweh stands before the people and I am in him, there's a dimension of his glory that reflects, that not just brings peace and rest, it overshadows the creation. Uh, I begin to see that as a glorified being in Christ, what I reflect is life. That's why we begin to understand that I, as a son of Yahweh, am a sign and a wonder. We are, um, this is something weird, but I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but I heard this testimony. Um, Mark Steen stands by the tree wanting to bring his kids a little bit closer to show them um, something, and he falls back into the tree. <laughs> and, and I know that this is, this is just one testimony I've heard. I know that there's several out there, men and women that's glorified, doing crazy things that we can't even begin to fathom. It's just the Father wanting, to us, wanting us to begin to understand that this body will be powerful and it will be something that we've never experienced. It will be Moses coming down the mountain, uh, lion, ox, eagle, man, fire, lightning, uh, burning to such an extent that it can smash gold to powder. Uh, that's incredible. We don't even perceive that. You know, he was, he was coming down in the glory of Yahweh. Yeah. It was incredible. And that's something that we have today because we don't have to um, walk without the fullness of Yeshua like he did, we get to walk in the glory. We need to understand it, but we can't believe. And once you believe, all these things fall into place, right? It will be a, re a recognizable body, of course. We will be known to others. It will come to pass as uh, he sat at, um, 
as he sat at meat with them, uh, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and their eyes were open and they knew it was him and he vanished out of their sight. <laughs> they knew it was him. He revealed himself to them. You know, I, I remember listening to someone share a testimony where he was with preaching and he was taken in the, in the midst of his sermon he was taken uh, on a, an encounter in the, in the spirit so he was still preaching it was just something he saw in the spirit something that happened and basically he was he found himself in Russia at uh, a door knocking and a little girl opened the door he's still preaching on this side of the veil but he's gone in an encounter and he's sitting with this little girl by her bed and they're praying together and after a while he comes back and he just continues to preach Preach. When they look at the recording, when he had this encounter, his, his physical body went see-through. Wow. <laughs> you know, we look at uh, Millie Bennett, now her last name has changed because she got married and I'm not too sure what that is now. But uh, she talks about uh, Billy washing the dishes and while she's washing the dishes, she was engaging, just worshipping, just going into the kingdom as deep as what she could find. And uh, her mother starts freaking out. When she turns around, her mother tells her that one side of her body was completely gone and the other side was translucent. The same lady at work just engaging with Yahweh while engaging, walking into her boss's office and he starts freaking out like he's seen a ghost. And a matter of fact, that's exactly what he screamed, ghost. And she's like, what's wrong? And he's like, well, you aren't translucent. <laughs> now, how you explain that, I don't know, but we're beginning to understand that this body will be completely different, yeah. but yet completely the same. Right. There will be a spiritual body and a physical body, right? It is shown um, a natural, it, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Until we get our new body, we, we watch and wait for his coming. See, he wants us to begin to believe now yes. that in his resurrection, I have the change of DNA. That's why he longs for the revelation of eating and drinking, taking communion constantly, finding yourself always busy engaging in who he is because it's that everlasting life that changes my DNA. It's understanding, well, you don't have to grow old. Now, well, that's too late for me and too late for some of us, but how do, the, how do we regain our, our, our uh, victory in this? Because I believe that there's a possibility. If I look at... Um, if I can find this lady's name, I keep forgetting her name, she's this incredible little lady on, uh, on YouTube. Um, okay, anyway, she, she's probably in her 70s, but she looks like she's in her, in her late 40s, maybe at max. Nancy Cohen. Nancy Cohen. I mean, she's just absolutely incredible. And she's in her 70s, but she's just young, she looks like a young lady. Because she, she's just lives outside of the norm of what we believe. You know, because she's seen the miraculous. She's walked in the miraculous. You know, she shares a testimony where she goes to a, a tribe of people, and just before she got there, she was in the knowledge of this. The previous um, missionaries that was there got eaten by them. Oh. By animals. And not just that, she has to go there, and they don't wear any clothes. She's the only one with clothes on. Now, in today's society, that's not going to go down well. Because we think that nakedness is sin. <laughs> How you guys doing? Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not thyself, because in Him we prosper in His way, because of the man who brings wicked devices to pass. See, the Father wants us to see this, and this is what I've realized in my walk over the last couple of days, the last couple of months. It's when I find myself resting in Him, it's in a dimension of intimacy, a dimension of revelation. It's not just something I say. It's not rest like we perceive it. Rest is not sleeping. When he says, I'm going to give you my beloved's rest, he's not talking about sleep. He's not saying, well, I'm going to give you uh, eight, eight good hours of sleep every night so you can be refreshed. It's finding yourself in him, resting. And in this rest, you're in communion, you're in communication, you're in relationship, you're in intimacy. And inside of him is where you get replenished. Inside of him is where you're busy eating and drinking of him. Inside of him where you become glorified. It's in Him that you begin to overshadow your soul and your body to expose the natural to the supernatural, to expose the mortal to the immortal, to expose the, the um, corruptible to the incorruptible. It's the desire of the Father for me to find myself in rest, 
in him to overshadow who I'm meant to be divinely created to be. So that what I am as a called son of Yahweh can begin to walk in fruition or come in fruition. So we as the church can become what we're supposed to be. Yes. The ecclesia is this, and I've shared this several times, but it just makes so much sense to me. The ecclesia is those who believe not because of what we've studied and what we've meditated on, because the Bible tells us he's in me and I'm in him. Right? But in reality, the church only believes that he's in me. Because the church don't believe that I'm in him. Because if the church believes that I'm in him, then we can go behind the back. Because then according to reality, I'm seated in him in heavenly places. But we never believe that. So in reality, what we believe is that uh, he's in me, and that's as far as we go. The ecclesia believes that he's in me and I'm in him. Which means I operate as a spirit being in him, in the kingdom of heaven. Where I'm seated in heavenly places. Now it's in that place where I find rest. It's in him where his glory and his fire overshadows me. Where I begin to realize that Zoe life begins to take effect in my heart. Begins to take effect in my life. Which I then bring into the earth and it changes me. To become that which is desired me to be. That's why when I understand that my spirit is glorified. I begin to believe that the overshadowing of my, my spirit over my soul. Gets my soul to be glorified. That's where my soul and my spirit is divided. So that my soul can become that glorified designer. Or the glorified design that was always designed for me to walk in. And then of course my, my spirit needs to overshadow my body. For my body to begin to walk in the fullness of believing. And it's just where it starts. To believe that I can be glorified. Right. You know, I, I've preached this for the last five years, four years, trying to get myself to believe. And I remember one, one night having an incredible time with the Lord, having an incredible meeting, coming home, and I didn't say anything, I didn't do anything, I didn't do I just greeted my wife, gave her a kiss, and started packing up my stuff to get her ready for the next meeting. And she looks at me with this weird, clear look, and she says, You know that it's your soul. And I'm like, What do you mean? It's my soul. She says, your soul's the problem. That's what needs to change. Because your soul is that part of you that is the belief system. That's that part of you that's going to allow you in or keep you on the side. It's that part of you that's going to say, well, it's possible to be glorified. It's possible to overshadow the sun and moon. It's possible to align earth. It's possible to walk as the sun and the earth. It's possible to do what the Father called you to do. Or it's going to say, well, it's just not possible. You can't believe it. You're speaking weird languages. You're reading a Bible, a book that no one understands. You worship the God you can't see. And it's just, it's that re-transformation that your soul needs yes. to bring all of this into fruition. Mm -hmm. So I guess we close with this saying that your soul is the focal point of change. That's why I want to constantly eat. That's why I take bread when I eat of him. That's why I take wine when I drink of his blood. Because my soul can perceive that. And the more I do it, the more it's going to change the system of what I believe in the natural so that the supernatural can overshadow it. Amen. Now next time uh, we're going to do the glorified being of the, 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 the new creation. Um, that will be the last part of this. Father, we just want to thank you and praise you. And I know that, I know that it's, almost, it's so easy to see my spirit glorified. And it's easy to see my soul kind of glorified. But when it comes to the physical body, when it comes to the physical things of what we have perceived and looked at all our lives, it, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Because we've lived in this and understood only this for so many years. To change my belief system, I have to engage at a higher place. I have to go to a deeper dimension for this to physically begin to change. We've seen superhero movies and we've seen the Superman uh, and the Spider-Man and the, all the, the weird stuff that's out there. Uh, Doctor, I don't know, even, there's so many, Doctor Strange. And there's so many superheroes out there that we're now beginning to understand. It's really just a reflection of what the son from the daughter of Yahweh needs to be. It's where the, 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 the Hollywood begin to see in the spirit because the church is not looking into that place. They have believed for us, but yet it is our place in the reality of all of this, to begin to see and to perceive that the Father is more than any superhero can ever be. He has no limitations. He overshadows all things. He has power in all dimensions and all realms. He is all-knowing. He is omnipresent. He, there's no form of limitation in any way, fashion, or form. And He created me in His image. But yet, in reality, this is what brings me to complete and utter um, Brokenness. I just cannot perceive a uh, limitless life. Yet he has called me to a uh, limitless life. He has even said that in Christ all things are possible. 
And we have never even understood that scripture until we became spirit beings. Realizing, well, if my spirit has no limitations and it's my primary being, then it gets to overshadow my soul and my body. My soul and my body lives in my spirit. I begin to walk in that limitless life in believing and understanding <coughs> who you've created and designed us to be. And I want to pray, Father, right now that that dimension of revelation opens up to us. Yes. And we begin to, understand, we begin to understand that this is a possibility and that you've called the Ecclesia to a higher place, a deeper place, to be signs and wonders. To walk in your fullness and to understand what it means to be in full fruition of what you've created us to be. Yeah. Father, we love you, we praise you, we honor you. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Yes.